Hello, this is Professor Kitch, and welcome to this webcast on field compaction control. Here are the learning outcomes for this lesson. This presentation will concentrate on the outcomes outlined in red. The other outcomes were either covered in previous lessons, or you will accomplish them during your problem sets or laboratory experiences. First, let's review the Proctor compaction test. When we've completed a compaction test, We'll have generated a plot of the dry unit weight as a function of compaction moisture content. A typical plot will have the shape shown here, with dry density starting low at a low moisture content, increasing as the moisture content increases to a peak value, and then decreasing again with increased moisture content. We'll assume this particular curve came from a test following the modified Proctor procedures that is ASTM standard D1557. The compaction curve cannot cross the line of 100% saturation or the zero air voids line. This is a theoretical maximum value of compaction which can be achieved and will never get there. The tail of the compaction curve at high water content will be roughly parallel to the zero air voids line. At the peak of the curve, we will have the maximum dry density, gamma D max, which will occur at the optimum water content, W optimum. Let's assume for this particular soil and compaction energy, the maximum dry unit weight is 120 pounds per cubic foot, and the optimum moisture content is 11.5%. We'll use these data from the Proctor compaction test to determine if the soil is properly compacted in the field. The measure we use to determine acceptability of our field compaction is the relative compaction, or C sub R. C sub R is defined as the dry unit weight achieved in the field divided by the maximum dry unit weight from the Proctor lab tests. Let's assume we've achieved a dry unit weight of 110 pounds per cubic foot in the field. Our relative compaction then would be 110 divided by 120, or 91.7%. When we specify compaction requirements, we generally do so as the percent of Proctor maximum dry unit weight. For example, we might specify the field compaction needs to reach 90% of modified Proctor. In this case, that would be 0.9 times 120, or 108 pounds per cubic foot. If we draw a line at 108 pounds per cubic foot on our lab compaction curve, we can identify the acceptable range of water contents over which we can achieve 90% or more of the maximum dry unit weight. This is valuable information for the contractor who will be performing the field compaction work. This table presents typical compaction requirements for various types of applications. Notice that for applications where low compressibility and high strength are critical, such as below building foundations, we can specify compaction requirements in excess of 100% modified Proctor. This means that in the field, the contractor would have to use more compaction energy than is used in the modified Proctor test. Now that we understand relative compaction and how requirements are generally specified, let's discuss the approaches to making field measurements of compaction. There are three basic approaches. The first is to directly measure the total unit weight and moisture content after the soil has been compacted in the field. With these measurements, we can compute the dry unit weight and compare it to the dry unit weight required by the appropriate specification. A second method is to measure how much nuclear radiation is transmitted through the soil. Because some of the nuclear radiation will pass through the soil particles and some will be deflected, we can use correlations with these measurements to determine both the water content and unit weight of the compacted soil. Finally, we can directly measure either the soil modulus or strength in the field. Recall, these are the two properties we're really most interested in, so it would make sense to measure them directly rather than use dry unit weight as a proxy for these properties. The first method, measuring the in-situ density, is the most common method. 
There are a number of different ways of doing this, but they all follow the same basic procedure. First, we create a hole in the, in the compacted soil at the ground surface and collect all the soil from the hole in a container. Once we've collected the soil, it's relatively easy to measure the weight of the soil collected from the hole and to determine its water content. Then we must find a way to measure the volume of the hole itself. We'll discuss a number of ways of doing that. Once we know the volume of the hole, the weight of the soil it contained, and its moisture content, we can compute both the total and dry unit weight of the soil after it was compacted. There are three common methods for measuring the volume of the hole from which our soil sample is taken. The most straightforward of these is the drive cylinder test. This method requires a hollow steel cylinder with a driving head attached and some way to drive it into the ground. The process is quite simple. We place the empty cylinder at the ground surface and pound it fully into the ground using the mallet. We then extract the cylinder. If the soil all remains in the cylinder, it's a straightforward process to determine the unit weight. The volume of the sample is equal to the volume of the inside of the cylinder. If we measure the unit weight of the soil inside the cylinder and measure its moisture content, then we can compute both the total and dry unit weights of the soil. Although this method is straightforward, it has a number of shortcomings. First, it can be difficult to drive the cylinder into this compacted soil, particularly if the soil contains gravel. During the process of driving, the soil can become even more compacted inside the cylinder. And it can be hard to keep the cylinder completely full of soil when removing it from the ground. For these reasons, this is actually not a very accurate method for determining the in situ unit weight. And it's not often used to monitor compaction. The second method for determining the whole volume is called the sand cone method. In this method, we have a bottle full of clean dry sand with a known unit weight. The bottle is attached to a cone or inverted funnel and placed over the hole. We then open a valve between the bottle and the funnel and allow the sand to flow out of the bottle and into the hole. Once the sand has filled the hole, we close the valve and remove the bottle and cone assembly from the hole. We can then measure the weight of the sand left in the bottle and use that to determine the weight of the sand filling the hole. With the weight of the sand in the hole, we can compute the volume of the hole since we know the unit weight of the sand. There are a lot more details to this test, but you get the basic concept from this. We'll be doing this test during a future lab session and you'll learn all the details then. This test is rather time consuming but it's the most accurate of all the methods for determining the unit weight of the compacted soil in the field. The third method used to measure the whole volume is called the balloon method. This method uses a special graduated cylinder apparatus. Inside the cylinder is a balloon. There's a hand pump attached to the apparatus, which is used to pump air into the cylinder. The cylinder is filled with water and placed over the hole. The air is then pumped into the cylinder. As the air is pumped in, it fills the balloon with water and pushes it down into the hole. Once the balloon has completely filled the hole, we can read the volume of water pushed into the hole. Now that we know the volume of the, of the hole, we can compute the, both the total volume and the dry unit weight of the soil. This method is not as accurate as the sand cone method because it's difficult to get the balloon to completely conform to the shape of the hole. This is especially true if the fill material contains larger gravel pieces. A variation on the balloon method is used when we want to measure the unit weight of fill material that consists of very large gravel or cobbles. This occurs in rock fills like the one shown in this photo. This particular rock fill is part of an earth dam being constructed. In this method, we place a large ring about a meter in diameter at the surface of the fill. In this case, a plywood ring is being used, 
but sometimes steel rings are used. The fill materials are excavated from the hole. This can be a long and tedious process for a rock fill such as this one. The material is weighed as it's removed. In this particular case, the material is also being sieved to determine the range of particle sizes. The hole is then lined with plastic sheeting and filled with water. The volume of the water needed to fill the hole is measured. And now it's possible to compute the unit weight of the rock fill. This particular test takes a long time. To summarize, methods used to directly compute the in situ density follow the same procedure. We create a hole in the ground where the compacted fill has been placed and collect all the material from the hole. We then weigh the material and determine its moisture content. We then measure the volume of the hole using either the drive cylinder, sand cone, or balloon method, or in a case of rock fill, we can use the water ring method. We now know the volume of the hole as well as the weight of the material in it and its moisture content. We can then use these three quantities to determine both the total and dry unit weights of the compacted fill material. Next, we're going to look at a completely different way to determine the density of a compacted fill, the nuclear densitometer. The nuclear densitometer consists of a box which contains a nuclear source. The source actually contains two different radionucleotides. One emits a gamma radiation, high energy protons. Cesium-137 is usually used for this source. The second source emits fast neutrons. This source is usually made of americium-241 and beryllium or californium-252. At the front of the device are two detectors, one for gamma radiation and one for neutron radiation. There is also a control panel which operates the device and displays the measurements. To make the measurement, the probe with the nuclear source is inserted into the ground. The radionucleotides start emitting radiation. Some of the radiation passes through the soil and is detected by the sensors. Some of the radiation is scattered by the soil and water particles in the ground and does not reach the sensors. If we know the strength of the nuclear sources, we can determine how much radiation was transmitted and how much was scattered by the soil and water particles. The gamma radiation is scattered by the soil minerals. Therefore, the percent of gamma radiation reaching the gamma detector can be correlated with the dry density of the soil. The more solid material, the more scattering, and the lower the reading at the detector. The neutron radiation is scattered by the hydrogen in the water. The more water, the more scattering, and the lower the reading at the detector. The device converts gamma and neutron radiation measurements into density and moisture content readings based on the correlation data which has been entered into the device. This method is much faster than any of the previous methods we have discussed. There is no need to dig a hole in the ground, no need to take a sample or to determine the water content. You simply place the device on the ground, insert the probe, and push a button. We have decades of experience using this device to measure soil density and it's well established in both specifications and codes. However, it is less accurate than the sand cone method. The devices are expensive and require special nuclear safety training and permits into storage. That covers all the common methods used to determine the density of soils compacted in the field. These are the most common ways we evaluate the quality of a compacted fill. We measure the in situ dry unit weight and then compare that to the Proctor maximum dry unit weight to determine the relative compaction. However, let's not forget that the material properties we really want to know about our fill are its modulus and strength. In the next section, We'll look at ways we can measure these properties rather than using dry unit weight as a proxy measurement. The Dynamic Cone Penetrometer, or DCP, is a device first developed in South Africa to determine the quality of pavement subgrade soils. It consists of a rod with a steel cone at the end. The cone is driven into the ground with a slide hammer and a number of blows required to drive the cone a certain distance is recorded. 
The test looks a lot like a mini standard penetration test, except that it drives a small solid cone rather than a standard split spoon. With every drop of the hammer, the penetration distance is measured. The DCP index is the number of millimeters per blow. We can correlate this DCP index with both soil modulus and soil strength. We're not really directly measuring modulus or strength with this method, but we're using a strength-related measurement to correlate rather than using dry unit weight. The ASTM standard for this test is D6951. The GeoGauge is a proprietary device made by Humboldt Manufacturing. It uses a dynamic process to measure soil modulus. The device contains an electromagnetic vibrator or shaker. It also has two velocity gauges that are used to measure the displacement of the device on the ground surface as it's being shaken. During the measuring process, the device runs through a number of different frequencies of vibration from about 100 to 200 hertz. The total time for measurement at a given point is about 75 seconds. While the device is being shaken, the surface displacements are measured over the range of these frequencies. Elastic theory is then used to back calculate the soil modulus from the displacement measurements. These computations are all done by the hardware and software contained within the device. The dynamic soil modulus is displayed almost immediately after the measurements are completed. An ASTM standard has been developed for this device. Although the device has been around for more than a decade, it's still relatively new to practitioners and it's not widely used yet. The lightweight deflectometer is another relatively new device for measuring the in situ soil modulus. Unlike the GeoGauge, it's not a proprietary system and there are a number of different manufacturers producing these devices. The device consists of a load plate, a sensor package that measures both force applied to the load plate and its displacement, a spring system to apply force to the load plate, and a guide rod. And finally, a drop weight to deliver energy to the spring system. Neither the height of drop nor the mass of the drop are set. Generally, the drop height is less than a meter and a mass of the drop weight is usually between 10 to 20 kilograms. When the drop weight is released, it impacts the spring system and generates a half sine wave with a duration of 10 to 30 milliseconds. The sensor package at the bottom of the unit measures both the force applied to the plate and its displacement into the soil. The force displacement measurements are used to back calculate the dynamic soil modulus. These systems come with built-in computers or use an application on smartphones to perform all the necessary computations. The measurements are very fast. There is an ASTM standard for this test, E2835. Like the GeoGauge, this is a relatively new system that has been in use for only a few decades. The system is being used more than the GeoGauge, mostly because there are multiple manufacturers. There does seem to be some problem with repeatability of the measurements between different manufacturers' devices. The main thing holding back more extensive use of these devices like the dynamic cone penetrometer, geogauge, and lightweight de deflectometer is the lack of adoption of them in codes and specifications. Only a few state departments of transportation have standards for the use of these newer devices in performing evaluations of field compaction. The industry has nearly 100 years of experience using dry unit weights to determine the quality of compacted fills. More experience is needed with these newer devices before they become standard practice. One of the most promising new technologies for the measurement and control of field compaction is intelligent compaction. Intelligent compaction is a system which combines active instrumentation of compaction equipment and fast computer analysis to give real-time information about the quality of compacted fill during the construction process. The system includes instrumenting equipment with GPS receivers for location data, 
electronic sensors to measure power output of the equipment, and accelerometers on the rollers to measure the interaction of the rollers with the soil. The machine power sensors and accelerometers are used to measure compaction quality, and the GPS system gives data over the entire construction site. The data from these sensors are fed into an onboard computer system in the cab of the compactor and give the operator real-time feedback on whether adequate compaction has been achieved. The data can also be uploaded and reviewed in the construction office in real time. These systems are now coming out of the development stage and being adopted by a number of state DOTs. They're most appropriate for large construction projects where the expense of setting up the equipment and data systems is offset by reduced construction costs and increased construction equality. Before I end this presentation, I want to briefly talk about two types of lightweight fills that can be very useful in certain engineering projects. At 120 to 140 pounds per cubic foot, Compacted soil fills are very heavy and induce significant loads in the in situ soil. In some cases, like road embankments, the loads from the soil greatly exceed the working loads from the vehicle traffic. When building on soils, these embankments can cause large settlements or even failures of the underlying soils. One way to combat this problem is with lightweight fills. The lightest of lightweight fills is geofoam, which is essentially large blocks of polystyrene foam. The unit weight of this material is 1 to 3 pounds per cubic foot, 1 to 3 percent of the unit weight of soil fill. In this photo, geofoam is being used to construct an approach for a bridge overpass. The foam will be covered with approximately a meter of soil, which will be compacted in a conventional manner. Another lightweight fill material is tire-derived fill. This is waste material made by shredding tires and removing all the metal reinforcing wires from the shredded tire material. Sometimes tire-derived fill is a mixture of waste tire material and soil, and sometimes it's just waste tire material as shown here. The unit weight of tire-derived fill can be as low as 45 pounds per cubic foot or about one-third of conventional compacted soil fill. So it has the additional benefit of using a waste material and is therefore a very green construction technique. Well, I hope you found this lesson on field compaction useful and informative. And have a great day.